Give me a recap sort of of this book and sort of your thoughts on how Netflix has changed since you left the company. So that will never work is really the sto untold story of Netflix. I mean, it's about how a couple of guys with no experience in the video industry took a crazy idea that no one thought would work, that, that my wife didn't think would work, and somehow turned it into a company which is changing the face of television. Well, Mark, it is changing the face of television, and arguably, I wanted to show a chart to our Bloomberg audience here because when we talk about Netflix, you can't talk about Netflix without also talking about the ways in which it's changing television, which is its free cash flow and the rate at which it is burning through cash to stay ahead of all of those competitors. As you take a look sort of at Netflix now and how it's progressed over these years, does it concern you at all about the competition that's heating up and the cash that Netflix is spending to frankly stay ahead? So Taylor, I haven't worked at Netflix for almost 16 years, so I can't really talk specifically about the tactics or the strategies they'll use to compete in these streaming wars. The only thing I actually know something about is the culture, because the culture, of course, springs from how the founders treat each other. It springs from how the founders treat their employees. So I do know a few things about Netflix and its capacity to compete. I mean, for one, Netflix has always been about the customer. It was never about streaming. It was never about shipping DVDs. It was about helping people find movies they love. And the second special thing about Netflix is the fact that they push decision making so deeply down in the organization. It's that freedom and responsibility culture. And what that does is give them the capacity to respond so quickly to any threats or any opportunities. So when I take both of those, I actually feel quite confident in Netflix's ability to respond to the fact that there's gonna be so many new entrants. And how does that culture set Netflix apart and set them up for success as everyone else tries to come after it? Well, at the beginning, and I talk about this in the book, we couldn't have time to tell everyone, here's exactly how to do your job. Instead, all you can really say is, here's where we're going and I'll meet you there. And trust them to figure it out and then you give them the freedom to do that. Now that's easy for Reed Hastings and I to do when we have seven employees. A little bit harder when you have 70, really hard when you have 700, but Netflix now has 7,000 and they still work that way. So even though Netflix to some is the big behemoth, to Netflix, they're still a startup. They still are willing to do whatever that takes. Well, you do have a lot of competition coming after Netflix, even though they probably think they are pretty small. What would be your biggest advice to a company in the streaming service or your advice to Netflix on how to differentiate yourself and stay ahead? So my advice is the same whether it's to Netflix or to any company in the streaming wars. My advice is the same to any big company or even to any startup. Number one, you do have to always put the customer at the center of your decision making. Once you begin thinking about what's best for shareholders rather than for customers, once you begin thinking about what's better for your infrastructure, that's when you get into trouble, both in business and in ethics. I also say you've got to focus. You have to say what is the most important thing we're doing and stick to that, even though there's dozens of other things that seem important. You know, uh, you are an entrepreneur and you're investing and constantly looking at new opportunities. Where do you see the next opportunity? Taylor, that is the, that's the big question. And if I knew exactly what was coming next, boy, I'd be in that business right now. One thing I've learned is whenever you have a new idea, everyone says the same thing. They say, that'll never work. But my motto is, hey, nobody knows anything. No one really knows a good idea from a bad idea until after you try it. So whether the future is you know, uh, artificial intelligence, whether the future is avatars, whether it's uh, beaming movies telepathically into your head, who knows? Uh, that's why it's so exciting, though, to be a consumer and just see what's happening with the way TV's being made and delivered. Well, and as a consumer, one thing that we always talk about when we talk about competition in the streaming wars is pricing. You have a slew of people coming out with $5 a month, $7 a month. Netflix, their most popular program is around $13 a month or so. As a consumer, do you feel like it's just a race to the bottom here in terms of 
frankly, what you'll have to pay, and everyone might now have to lower the prices to keep up? No, I think what's happening with these prices is you're allowing people to have multiple services, to pick from a menu, so to speak. I mean, compare this to just a handful of years ago when your only choice was cable, and you had to pay in the $120, $140 a month, you really only could have one. Now, certainly with uh, Apple coming out $5 and Disney, Netflix being in that 10 ish dollar range. There's no reason you can't have more than one. Yes, perhaps there'll be a shakeout at some point, but I don't see this being one company survives. I think what'll happen is there'll be multiple people who all specialize, who all offer a range of choices, and ultimately, I think that's a fantastic thing for the consumer.